you. Thanks very much. And thanks for inviting me here to Paris to talk. This is going to be a difficult talk. Not so much for me, but probably for you. I'm going to... Uh, the big reason I'm here is, uh, honestly, I think France uh, deserves much more innovation from technology. And I absolutely will argue it's your, the issue is not because of talent. In fact, that's pretty easy to prove because in San Francisco, in Silicon Valley, we have a long history of bringing in very talented people from France into California to help us. Some of the best engineers, for example, at Google came from here, come from here. It's, the issue is not talent, but I would argue the issue is how you work. And in particular, and this is why I think this is going to be uh, a little rough, is most of the companies that hire and build technology here in this country are, are companies that were from before the internet era. They've been here many, many years. And, there, and of course, there's nothing wrong with that. That's uh, wonderful. But the way those companies work consistently fails when it comes to technology products. And I actually have, uh, I mean, I have history in two major other other major world cities, one with London and another with New York. Both of those cities had, I would argue, the same root issues. And both of them have, uh, today, are completely different in terms of technology products, completely transformed. London is amazing, New York is amazing. There's really no difference today between the level of innovation in London and New York than San Francisco. It's consistent. And it's because um, I think fundamentally they have changed how they work. Now, and what I hope to do in this uh, few minutes I have with you is to point out the real issues with how you're working. And my goal with that is for you to, s to start to rethink how you're working. I only have time to really point out the problems. I'll spend just a few minutes on the alternative. But if you're interested, if, you, if I convince you at all that maybe the way you're working at your company today is not very good, then hopefully you're motivated to go learn more. Just a little bit uh, about me. Fabrice gave a, a bit of an explanation. But I started at Hewlett Packard, HP Labs, the research labs. So I, I started from the engineering side. And a lot of people in technology started from engineering, but they come from everywhere. But after 10 years of doing technology products, I did join a young uh, Netscape, uh, which, by the way, had our European headquarters right here in Paris. and. Um, I remember because I remember the police would see what time we went into the office and what time we left the office. And that was the first time that had ever happened to me. Um, and then uh, after Netscape, I joined a young eBay and built their product organization at eBay. So I've um, been doing product for actually a very long time. Uh, so I started Silicon Valley Product Group after eBay. Uh, but I've been working with technology product teams for 30 years now, and uh, it's a wonderful thing to do. <laughs> uh, so what I wanted to do was start out, I'd like to start out by describing to you, and I'll be quick here, I want to describe to you how most companies working in the old way work. Now, my belief is if you work at a bank, if you work at an insurance company, if you work at a telco, I would bet money right now that you are almost certainly working like this. So don't feel bad, too bad. <laughs> uh, you're not alone. But those companies are not known for innovation, certainly not known for consistent innovation. And I want you to have a good understanding of why. Now, I also have to be clear, caref careful. I only work on technology products. 
only technology. If you're working on something other than a technology-powered product, then some of what I'm talking about probably isn't so relevant. But technology-powered products. Now, today, most banks, most uh, insurance companies, most telcos realize that they're actually a technology-powered company. There's some that don't even realize that yet. I, there's not much I can do to help them. But assuming your company does realize that you need to be a technology-powered company and you depend on consistent product innovation, then I'd argue this is critical. Okay, so very quickly, I'll, I'll just highlight how I think you work, and then I'll go through one at a time the 10 biggest reasons this is fatal flaw. Okay, the first one is that everything starts from ideas. In most of your companies, those ideas come typically from your executives. That's where most of the ideas come from. If uh, certain companies might actually get some ideas from their bigger customers. Most companies, in the old way of working, everything revolves around this idea of a roadmap, product roadmap. A product roadmap is just a prioritized list of features and projects. Those things that the business, if you've heard that phrase, the business thinks they need. And it's prioritized because of, well, two reasons. One is management wants to be, they want to make sure you're working on the most important things first. And also they want to be, they want to plan. They want to know what's going to happen in this quarter, next quarter, what's going to happen by tax season, holiday season. Okay, so in order to do that roadmap, most companies do some form of a business case. I have it in quotes because most companies today, those are informal business cases, not formal. Uh, and they, they do that business case mostly because they, they need to prioritize these features and projects somehow in order to, um, to make sure you're working on the most important things first, which, which is reasonable. Eventually, though, something comes off. It's now time. We now have time to work on the next thing. We have people available we can work on the next thing. And then we'll, we'll typically gather requirements. This, this is the stage where you decide, all right, the, uh, the idea on the roadmap might have been integrate PayPal as a new payment method, which many, many companies uh, have on their roadmap. What does that really mean, though? Are you doing it to be able to buy goods in France from a merchant in uh, Germany, that might be one reason to do it, or for something else. So requirements need to be defined. And then typically design happens. Now I'm referring here to user experience design, those people that design the workflows and the visual design. And then uh, eventually we start to build something. With software especially, everything, of ultimately you have to build it. That's, <laughs> I'm not sure how many of you, I hope almost all of you, though you're in your companies, you're using some form of agile methods. If anybody doesn't know what I'm referring to, um, you can look that up after. But I'm, assume, I'm gonna assume most of you, you're using some form of agile. Scrum is the most common process, Kanban is another. But anyway, that's when it starts to show. At this point, the engineers might start uh, building in a series of what's known as sprints or iterations. And then test is referring to quality assurance here, really. Making sure it works like it's supposed to work. And eventually, oh, there might be a couple sprints there known as hardening sprints to get it reliable. And then finally, it launches. This is when you go to your customers. You might have a press release. Okay, what I just defined was normal, old, again, old, but very, very common. And I would still argue this is by far the most common way of working in the world still. And that's, uh, I would also argue it's no coincidence. It's not a coincidence that 
that most teams struggle to actually consistently innovate. Now, even though I showed you a little bit of Agile here, I drew it this way on purpose because I'm emphasizing that if this is how you're working, this is very little, it's this much Agile. It is very much a waterfall process, if you've heard that phrase. It's, it's, it's an old, old way of working. And honestly, we have criticized this way of working for a generation, but what I wanted to do, because it's easy to say it's a problem, it's hard, what I need to do is make this real for you so you know why you're still doing this. Even though your engineers are almost certainly doing Agile, your company is anything but Agile. And this is, is so critical. So what I want to do now is go through the 10 big reasons this is such a fatally flawed way of working. The first is the source of the ideas themselves. I mentioned that most of the time your ideas are coming from your executives, sometimes they're coming from your customers. If you have a strong marketing organization, they might be doing things like holding focus groups. I shouldn't even, focus groups are uh, evil in their own right. We don't, that is not something we do in a technology product company. But even if you separate that, and actually, it's worth pointing out, the reason these things are so, the reason a focus group, the reason marketing-driven products are so bad consistently is really two fundamental reasons and is right at the heart of how we do modern technology products. The first reason is that our customers and our executives, they don't know what's possible. They don't know what's technically possible. Today, the, the vast majority of great product innovations are inspired not by the customer, actually the customer's pain can inspire, but not the solution. The solutions come from the technology. This is a huge, huge point. In fact, uh, you should still continue to take product ideas from your customers and from your executives. I'm not saying that all of their ideas are wrong. That's not true. But I am saying that consistently the best sources of your ideas are not from your customers and they're not from your executives. In fact, if you have to pick one of the many good sources of product ideas, Consistently, the best source are your engineers. And the, the thing that's amazing to me about so many companies, especially banks and insurance companies and telcos, is that they almost never even include the engineers in the discussions about coming up with those roadmaps. They're rarely even invited to the party. They're not there, which is a huge huge handicap. Now, why are the engineers so critical? Because they're in the best possible position to know what's just now possible with your technology. They're using the technology every day to solve problems. So they are your single best source. Now, we have to do some more, which I'm going to talk about. It's not enough just to include your engineers. But it starts with engineers. So we, we need to turn upside down how this works. And it starts with the source of ideas. This is a huge point. The second, I should mention too on this, another huge source of ideas today, and this came out, this will come out I'm sure throughout the day, the data itself. There are huge opportunities from data-inspired uh, innovations. The thing is, most of the time, the people that actually see and are working with the data every day are the engineers. So uh, again, you have to include your engineers in the picture, not just them. But Now, the next point I want to talk about is this problem known as the business case fallacy. 
Now, I have to be careful here. In my experience in this country, a lot of companies do like to do a business case. Actually, business cases are not a problem if they're done very differently than I'm about to describe. There is something called a high-integrity business case, which is very valuable, I would argue, especially if what you're proposing to build is large and expensive. But the way most companies do them, which is what I want to describe, that's the problem. The first thing most people know, in a business case, there's really two inputs. The first input is how much money do we think we're going to make? And the second input is how much do we think it's going to cost to build? It's usually called level of effort. Uh, in agile teams, they talk about estimations for that. But here's the problem. Those are two reasonable things, I would argue. Those are reasonable. Management should ask those questions. Now, they're asking them, again, because they want to prioritize a roadmap. The problem is, when they do it, when they work this way, so all you have is an idea. We want to integrate PayPal, or we want to redesign our product, or we want to move our product from France to the UK. These are common things to do. The problem is, at this stage, you have no idea how much money you're going to make. You can't have any idea how much money you're going to make. The reason is, is because the how much money you make, if anything, and I mean literally many efforts make nothing, and you'll see hopefully why, but anyway, you have no idea because you don't, it depends entirely on how good the solution turns out to be. If you've got something that your team just does a wonderful job on, it may redefine the course of your company. You know, one of the companies that uh, is, well, I'd actually argue Amazon is uh, w probably the most consistently innovative company in our industry. If you measure it by a company that's continuously disrupted themselves in l ways small and large, um, we can talk about Amazon's culture. It's kind of a, it's a rough culture to work in. There's a, it's a lot of hours. But in terms of their results, it's hard to argue. Amazon is amazing. Amazon does do business cases for their bigger efforts, but not like this. They don't work anything like this. In fact, what I'm describing, I'm really describing the ways companies like Apple and Amazon and Netflix and Tesla and Google and Facebook, uh, the how Pixar, how they work. So it's a very different model. But um, at one of the teams at Amazon did one of their most amazing products, which is AWS, Amazon's Web Services. And Earl, today, of course, we know that's about a uh, $8 billion business, $8 billion a year. But when they created that uh, effort, they made a business case. And I asked the product leader, when you were proposing doing AWS, how much money did you think you'd make? And his answer was, we told management we didn't know, but it was somewhere between $1 million a year and $1 billion a year. Okay, they had no clue. Of course, it turned out to be a lot more than that. But, um, and by the way, the same is true with the one of the, uh, mo another one of the most amazing products in our industry, Google AdWords. They had no idea it was going to be that successful. They couldn't. Now, most of the time, it's the opposite problem. We think we're going to make a million euros a year, and we end up making nothing. That's more common. And the most co there are several reasons for that, which I'm just about to go into. But um, in any case, you can't know how much money you're going to make. It depends if the solution is any good and if your customers actually want to buy that solution. Similarly, we have no idea how much it's going to cost to build because we don't know yet the details of the solution. We can go to our engineers and say we want to do a redesign or we want to integrate PayPal, and they'll say, but what does that mean? There's, there are literally 10 different ways to integrate PayPal. 
And it depends on what, which your uh, problems you're trying to solve, what the underlying solution's going to be. And so they, they don't know. Most of the time they just say, we don't know. And sometimes they're pressed because, again, management wants this roadmap. So then they'll say, and this is where a, a shortcut called t-shirt sizing. In other words, the engineers will just say, is it whether it's small, medium, large, or extra large. It's just a big compromise. So we call this just corporate silliness. It's, it's, we understand why it's done. It's because management wants to do that roadmap. We also know it's a lot of nonsense, but the real issue isn't this nonsense. And again, I do advocate a business case for expensive things, but not like this. In fact, one of the most profound things that I was ever taught came from Mark Andreessen, the co-founder of Netscape. He was my boss at Netscape. And he used to say, when we do technology products, the most important thing for you to remember is that you have to know what you can't know. And the truth is, in tech products, one of the things we can't know is what the solution is going to need to be. And we can't know how much it's going to cost because we don't know the solution yet. So the real issue, though, is the roadmap. If you did one thing starting tomorrow, I hope it would be to reconsider the, the problems caused by your roadmaps. My guess is that every one of you here in the room, your company has a roadmap. Some of you in the room may be the ones responsible for that roadmap. Now, we need to acknowledge there are real needs and, and uh, purposes for that roadmap, and I'm not saying those are unfair. The, the most common one is management wants to know what you, uh, that you're working on the most important things, like I mentioned, and also they want to be able to predict some level of what's going to happen each quarter. Some companies even do yearly roadmaps. If that's that's really bad. I mean, I'm hoping most of you aren't doing that. Most people are doing three-month roadmaps or a rolling three-month. But it's, uh, the, what I want to point out are why these roadmaps are so bad. I call it the two inconvenient truths about product. The first inconvenient truth about product is that at least half of the items on your roadmaps are never going to work with customers. Now that's not, um, that's not because any of you are not smart or anything like that. In fact, it's interesting to me, the smarter the company, the more they expect their roadmap items to fail. So the, the, the first reason we are not, you know, we think customers are going to be so excited to have this new feature. Maybe they desperately want to use PayPal to pay instead of whatever. And then we build it, and then they don't use it. That's the most common reason we see. We're excited, but our customers are not. Sometimes our customers do try to use it, but then when they actually go through and try to pay with PayPal, because of the way you integrated PayPal and because of limitations in PayPal itself, they get frustrated and they give up. And maybe they actually, mo less people end up converting and buying than before. So sometimes the issue is the usability. Sometimes the issue is that we think, when we went to our engineers and said, we really want to integrate PayPal, how long will it take? And they said, well, it depends on many things. And then you say, but we need to know for the roadmap. And they say, one month. Wouldn't be surprised. One month. And you count on one month. But then once the engineers get started, and then you really start thinking about how you need this to work, they come back and say, now that we understand, it's not one month, it's probably closer to three months. Those are realistic numbers, by the way. And then you, uh, uh, and then you might say, well, this is, 
not worth three months of time. We could do so many other things in that three months. So uh, you kill it there. So for whatever reason, at least half the items on your roadmap are never going to work with customers. And by the way, if that surprises you, probably doesn't, but if it does, go, all you have to do, don't take my word for this, just go look over the last three, six months and compare the results for each of the things that you've built and deployed with what the original business argument was, what the original business case was. And, and as an open invitation, if any of you find that you were doing better than half, in other words, more than half actually met the objectives, please contact me, because I'm still waiting to meet a company that's that good. It, most of the time, companies will admit privately it's more like 20% actually meets their objectives. So, and that's not, again, that's just because it's very, very hard to know that. The second inconvenient truth, so the first was that at least half fail to meet our objectives. The second in inconvenient truth is of the other half, the half that could be great, could be good, those will take many iterations before they actually make money. Uh, usually that's three, four, five, or sometimes more iterations. So for example, in a product company, we don't really talk much about time to market. Time to market is sometimes interesting, for example, if you're doing something for the holiday period, the Christmas time. We often, in an e-commerce company, if it's not done by the beginning of October, it's really not useful till next year. We'd have to wait a year. So time to market does matter, but what really matters isn't that. What really matters is what we call time to money. In other words, time to it actually doing whatever it was supposed to do. And many of the services we build are not actually for money. It's, it's, uh, it might be a free service, an advertising-driven service. It's fine. It's time to value, time to creating that value. And in most products, it's going to take several iterations. The problem, of course, is if this is how you work, and again, I believe most of you are, then, well, it depends on your company here, but it probably takes on the order of three to six months to make it through this process. Three to six months. And if it takes four iterations through before you actually start making money, we're talking one to two years. Or more likely, your management will lose patience before that's over. But still, it's a long time before it actually ach achieves, achieves its objectives. So, the two inconvenient truths about product, at least half of our ideas are never going to work with customers, and the other half are going to take several iterations. The reason a roadmap is such a problem is because as soon as you put that label, roadmap, on a document, you're no matter what you say, and I've seen a lot of product teams try to give many caveats, but no matter what you say, the organization is going to want to con consider that a commitment. And that's the key. There's one of my favorite quotes, is actually uh, from Jeff Bezos, who does run Amazon, and he, um, he likes to say, be stubborn on your vision. That means when they decide to work on something, they're working on it for generally seven years. They're committing to working on something. So it's a long-term commitment. But be flexible on your details. Stubborn on vision, flexible on details. Roadmaps are the opposite of flexible on details. Roadmaps are all details. And when you publish a document that says, this is what we're going to do in the next three months, you are basically condemning your team to spending at least half of their time on things that are going to prove a mistake, a waste. And it's very hard to succeed 
and, and avoid failure if you're locking your team into spending such a high percentage of their time on failed work. So again, I'm going to talk about at the end, quickly, I'm going to talk about there's alternatives to everything I'm describing here, but I want you to understand why roadmap, <laughs> sorry, roadmaps are the r root of so much evil. Okay, I realize the clock is ticking on us. So the role of product. Let me just say that if this is how you're working and the product manager is the person gathering requirements, this is the opposite of a modern product role. This is not how we work. And in fact, you probably don't even, if this is how you're working, there's a good chance even if you have people with the title product manager, there's a good chance that you don't actually have product managers. Because modern product managers don't want to work in this environment. And there's good reasons why they don't want to. Similarly with the role of design. Um, in this environment, a good designer's not going to want to work. We call it, it's, it's the lipstick on a pig model. Okay, the, it's already doomed. So the product manager probably believes that the roadmap is already the wrong item, so they don't feel ownership. The designers almost certainly believe that this is the wrong solutions. Similarly, the engineers are, are building something where um, they almost certainly don't believe in what they're building. In fact, one of the most important points in modern product companies uh, it's a great quote from John Doerr, who's one of the original venture capitalists in our valley, in our industry, which is, we need teams of missionaries, not teams of mercenaries. I hope that translates. I, I'm not, this is not a religious talk. I'm not trying to make a religious argument. But I am, uh, missionaries, everybody on the team believes in what they're doing. They believe, they believe it's important. That's product, that's absolutely engineers. And in a mercenary organization, they're just there to implement someone else's ideas. And the, one of the quickest ways you can determine if you've got a strong organization or not is are your teams missionaries or mercenaries, starting with the engineers? Because it's the easiest to tell in engineers. We say if you're just using your engineers to code, you're only getting half their value. Okay, so the role of engineers, we need engineers and designers to play a much more central role. Similarly, like I mentioned before, this is hardly agile. This is not what Agile's about. If you're working this way, this is not the benefits of Agile. Let me say, though, in defense of the engineers, if you're working this way, this is as much Agile as the developers, the engineers, can actually do on their own. So it's not your engineer's fault. If this is how you're working, and you're probably not getting the real benefits of Agile, then uh, it's the fault of the leadership, not the fault of the engineers. Similarly, one of the big problems with this way of working, it's all about output. I mean, unfortunately, that's what a roadmap is. It's a list of output instead of business results. In other words, our goal is not to integrate PayPal. That's not a goal, that's a tactic. That's a tactic that may or may not work. Our goal might be to increase the number of customers we have outside of France. That's a totally realist, reasonable goal. And somebody thinks PayPal is the way to solve that. And it might be, but if it doesn't work, the product team is, has to figure out a way that does work. So what you want is a way of working that focuses on business outcomes not output. Also, the v we honestly don't know anything, if we're honest, we don't know anything in this way of working until we actually go live and now we can put it in front of real customers. This is considered the slowest, most expensive way we have to find 
whether or not something actually works with customers. If you're working this way, you've all, I'm sure most, if not all of you, have heard about lean startup and those techniques. This is the opposite of that. A lot of teams tell me they're lean startup and then they draw this on the wall and I know that they don't even have a clue. This is the opposite, the antithesis of lean startup. And the final point here is that in a true startup, and I realize most of you are from large companies, in a true startup, the reason this is so fatal, this way of working, is because you're going to almost certainly run out of money before you get to that traction you're looking for and you can get investors to, to give you more funding, almost certainly. Because this way of working is so slow and so expensive, you get maybe two or three attempts. But the truth is a startup usually needs somewhere between 50 and 100 attempts. And so if this is how they're working, they would need a tremendous amount of money and time. Most don't have anything like that. Now, in a larger company like where most of you are from, there's almost certainly, you know, you're not going to run out of money. The companies here in the room, you have plenty of money. The issue is management patience. So uh, usually after uh, six months, maybe 12, management has lost confidence that the team can actually solve this problem. So that's, uh, I would argue that's the biggest issue here is just the opportunity cost. What you could have been doing and should have been doing during that time. In the time it took you to do three months, one time through, a good product team could have done on the order of 50 I iterations, five zero. Now that might sound kind of shocking to you, but that's where I wanna take the next just remaining few minutes <laughs> and, uh, and give you a taste. I, I, need a, I would need a whole hour to describe even the high level for the alternative, but I can point you if you're interested. But I want to give you a taste of how, I mentioned those other great companies don't work the way banks do. So what is, it's referred to by lots of different terms, continuous discovery and continuous delivery, um, dual track, agile, it goes by different names. There are still ideas, the difference is the ideas come from all over, including and especially the engineers and designers on the team. And we instead, there is something called product discovery. Lean Startup is one of the most famous set of techniques to do product discovery. The purpose of product discovery is to separate quickly, literally in hours, the good ideas from the bad ideas. Once we've decided we have good ideas, we actually build a product quality implementation. That means something that's scalable and accurate and secure and fast performant. Now, in order to do this, the alternative to the roadmap is really two things. It's a product vision. You need to provide every product team, in fact, I should say, the key to this new way of working, the key is a strong product team. And I'm describing how every team works in this model. But everything boils down to strong product team. So for example, if your bank is currently outsourcing all your engineering to India, you've already failed, okay? So that's not a product team. We can talk more about it if anybody wants, but the idea is you have to give each team the big picture product vision, the compelling product vision, and then some sort of outcome-based performance management system. Most teams I work with today use something called OKRs. Uh, it was, OKR stands for Objectives and Key Results. It's been used for 10 years now by Google and Facebook and LinkedIn. So because of that, many, many companies use this system. It's the alternative to roadmaps. What it is is prioritize business outcomes. So instead of management giving 
product teams a roadmap of features, say build this, they give them a prioritized set of business results and tell the teams, go figure out how to solve these problems. It's a fundamentally different way of working. You may Im imagine it's because we need teams of missionaries, not mercenaries. All right. We also, in product discovery, the point is to run these rapid MVP tests. MVP stands for minimum viable product, but it's not a product, it's an experiment. Normally, we run on the order of 15 to 20 every week. Now, these quick experiments are usually prototypes, but not always, but they're usually prototypes. Uh, at Google, they like to talk, this, uh, talk about this as fake it before you make it. As Airbnb, they like to talk about it as uh, build things that don't scale. The point, though, at Facebook, they like to say uh, move fast but don't break things. This is move fast, this is don't break things. The ideas here are um, we are trying to quickly come up with a solution that answers four questions. The first one, would the user actually buy it or choose to use it if it's a new feature? Second, could the user figure out how to use it? Third, can we actually build it with the skill sets and the time and the technology we have? And fourth, can the different stakeholders in your company, legal, finance, marketing, the different stakeholders actually support your solution? Once we get good answers to those questions, then we build it, not before. It's a very different model of working. Our goal is to get to something called product market fit, which is where we can really, we have a product that can sustain a business and we can sell. So that's just a little peek. I probably created at least as many questions as I might have answered there, but I'm just trying to give you a peek that there is a very different way of working than what you are almost certainly doing today and that I'm hoping you consider bringing that to your company. Because I would argue to succeed, you must get good at this way of working. If you're truly a technology-powered product company, if that's what you believe you are, you just have to get good at this, or it's just a matter of time. Um, there are, if you're interested in hearing more about the alternative, um, if you just, Google uh, the terms. Uh, I did a talk actually recently at a, at a conference where I talked about the keys to success. And that talks much more about this other model.